Hello. Hello, church family. Good morning. My name, as John said, is Noah Carpenter, and I am the pastoral resident in children's ministries here at Northwest Chapel. And today, Pastor Rob asked me if I could share about what God has been teaching me um, in my life recently. And I find myself in a unique position, having just graduated from college and now entering the adult world, and that will guide much of what I have to say today. So before we begin, let us pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you just for the amazing opportunity it is to stand here today, Lord. I thank you for everything that you're doing in my life, everything you're doing in the lives of our church family, Lord. It's such a blessing to witness and be a part of. God, I just pray that today everything you say, um, everything I say is your words, Lord, not mine, um, and that you would have all the glory. Lord, it's in your name that I pray. Amen. All right. Well, since graduation and even before then, I've had to be doing a lot of just transitioning into this next stage of life. And in leaving one of the most significant parts of my life up to this point, I've been doing a lot of processing and reflecting. And in reflecting, I have been able to see so many of the ways that God has been faithful to me in my college career. Now, it started out very rough at Ohio State, but over the four years, I was able to see God meet and provide for me time and time again. And it was this faithfulness that fuels me to have confidence in all the life, God willing, that is in store for me. So today, I will be speaking on God's faithfulness. So what is faithfulness? Well, faithfulness comes from a place of trust and loyalty. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is a confidence for what we have hope for and an assurance about what we do not see. And it's one thing to simply believe in God. It's another to be faithful to him. Now, in the context of God's faithfulness, I want to read Deuteronomy 32.4. Verse 4 says, He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. So three things really stick out to me in looking at God's faithfulness. The first one being that God is reliable and dependable. Uh, In this, I think of an employee that the boss can count on, the boss can trust that maybe they pick for a certain task. The second thing is that God is trustworthy, which I think is something that I often take for granted. I can't imagine being worried about my future, my purpose, or even my existence in the context of a God that isn't trustworthy. And the third thing is that God will keep his promises and fulfill his duties. I want to read Deuteronomy 7, 9, which says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations and those who love him and keep his commandments. So what else does the Bible say about faithfulness? Well, I think we see a lot of God's faithfulness in the covenants that he makes with his people. Just a few of them. To Noah, God will save Noah and his people in Genesis. Also in Genesis, to Ishmael, God will bless Ishmael and his descendants. In Exodus, to Moses, God will spare the Israelites. To Jacob, in the Psalms, we see that God reaffirms his everlasting covenant to Israel. Now, another part of my job here um, that John mentioned was I work with the young adults, and we recently started doing a young adult Bible study on Sunday evenings. And in that, we've been studying so far the book of Daniel. And in that book, Judah, an Israelite nation, was overtaken by the Babylonians, which are considered the wicked nation. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians uh, constructs a golden image that he forces the people to worship. Now, four Hebrew men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, the later three also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refuse to worship this pagan idol, for they believe in the one true God, our God. Now, if you want to turn to Daniel 3, I'm going to read a short excerpt from there. It's going to be Daniel 3, 13 through 18. It'll also be up here if you want to read along. But starting in verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, 
is a true Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image you have set up. Now, in reading that, one phrase really sticks out to me. Verse 18, but even if he does not. Now, the passage says a lot about the faithfulness of these men, but what I want to focus on is how they present the faithfulness of God. But even if he does not, there was no doubt in these three men's mind as to the power of God to save them. Yet the way in which God would work out his plan for them in this situation was less clear. God's power is sometimes extended in dramatic ways to save his people as when he parted the Red Sea for Israel on their way out of Egypt. Yet at other times, that same power is withheld and his people are allowed to suffer. Either way, they still view God as faithful. Now this reminded me of 2 Corinthians 5-7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, this verse is not a reference to believing the unbelievable, but rather to living one's life based on the confident in God's promises for the future, even when we cannot yet see the fullness of the coming glory. Now, we're only able to be faithful because God is faithful. Despite changing and unstable seasons that life brings, we are called to trust in God's faithfulness. Now, (laughs) there have been plenty of times in my life where I would doubt the character of God. I would say, Father, you say this, but I see this. And this verse is convicting (laughs) in that we are not to let our circumstances define the character of God. Now, I'm a pretty emotional person, I must say, and much of my time in college was spent learning to center my emotions around Christ. I had to learn to let the truth of the word define God and not my circumstances. And this was really hard for me. The moment when I receive a 38% on a heavily weighted physics exam, God is faithful. The moment when a pandemic strips me of my community and normalcy, God is faithful. The moment when I'm caught in a panic attack, immobile on the ground, yelling for help, God is faithful. The moment when the weight of the world seems too much to bear and I don't know if I can carry on, God is faithful. Because my circumstances don't define God and they never, ever will. God is called faithful, and at the same time, his character is consistent. Therefore, he will always be faithful in his promises that he has made with us. And no high or low of my life will ever change that fact. So why is God not discredited when life is hard or disappointing? Well, it's because God never promised that life would be easy. In fact, he promised to his disciples, those closest to Jesus, that in life you will have trouble, John 16, 33. And while time and time again, hard times will feed me lies to doubt God's goodness, his character will always overcome. So what does it mean for God to be faithful to us? Well, it means that he will uphold his promises to us as believers. It means he will provide for us. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. 
His faithfulness means that he will forgive us. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, if, you confess, or if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It means he will not forsake us or abandon his people. Deuteronomy 4.31 says, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget his covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. It means he will remain faithful even when we as believers are faithless. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Now that verse right there really strikes me and i think it should strike all of you too we are sinners but god is faithful and he will pardon restore and keep those that are truly his i experience so much of god's love and resting in that so why is god's faithfulness encouraging to us going forward well looking back at the last four years i see god's faithfulness in the deep, dark, and painful seasons. And that gives me hope for where I am going. Listen, I am fearful of my future, paying off my student debt, saying goodbye to friends that I really love, and entering into the unknown of a new stage of life. Those things terrify me. But I can have the confidence in this, that if Christ was faithful to me then, he will be just as faithful to me now. And I can walk confidently knowing that Christ is waiting for me in my next stage of life. And he is with me now. And not only that, but he will be with me, guiding me to himself every step of the way. Listen, it's all about Jesus. Not what we can get from him, but who he is. I thank God for everything that he has taught me and everything he is teaching me, which is a lot. Now let us pray. God, I am just humbled by how miraculous your love is, Lord. God, that life can be hard sometimes, life can be good sometimes, but through it all, Lord, you are faithful, faithful, faithful. So God, I thank you so much for this church family, Lord. I thank you just to be up here and to share about the ways that I have seen you in my life, Lord. And I thank you that I have seen the ways that you have been faithful to me in my life, Lord. That's a blessing. So God, thank you for Jesus and everything that he has done for us. I thank you for Gabe and the message he will share with us. And it's in your heavenly name, Father, that I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. I just want to invite you to stand and let's continue to worship today.
has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who sets me free. lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, Hello, church family. Let me adjust the mic. I am so honored and humbled uh, to be with you all this morning, and I'm thankful to have this time once again uh, to be with the, fo- the loving family that is Northwest Chapel. Um, I was reminded last night, just thinking about it, of my first experience at Northwest Chapel. Um, it was third grade. I was a youngin. I was pretty short. I still am. Um, and I, uh, I'm excited to meet new people, new students, uh, just really pumped. And I get into the Sunday school classroom, and we're making birdhouses. And I'm not a huge fan of birds, but that's okay. I'm down for it. And so we, we, uh, I see what we're using. We're using cardboard, seeds, and peanut butter. And I am allergic to peanuts. Um, I, was, I was then escorted out of the room and shoved in the hallway and just stayed there for the whole time, and then I went to the next service. So um, I was reminded of that because last night I had a run-in with my mortal enemy, uh, the peanut, um, and I was actually in the uh, emergency room last night um, with, it felt like my throat was being closed in. So um, I am very thankful to be here this morning. A friend texted me this morning reminding me of Paul's verse in 2 Corinthians that says, God's power is made perfect through weakness, and I am feeling weak. Uh, I'm feeling just worn out, but I am so thankful to be with my family. So uh, let's get into it. This morning, we will be in the book of 1 Timothy uh, in chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And as you head there in your Bibles, on your phones, on your devices, I also wanted to say that I am thankful to be up here this morning and sharing the pulpit with my brother, Noah. Uh, you all should consider yourselves quite blessed to have someone so, who clearly cares for those who he's around um, with your children's ministry and with your young adult ministry. I am so grateful for his ministry to me, and I know you all will be blessed to keep him around. Um, so follow along as I read from 1 Timothy. I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. In March of 1820 in Brewster, New York, a baby girl was born to a father named John and a wife named Mercy. At just six weeks of age, she started to have a a cold and her eyes became inflamed. 
A doctor recommended using a certain solution that involved hot mustard for her eyes that ended up leading to permanent blindness for the rest of her life. Six months later, her father would pass away and she would be mainly raised by her mother and her grandmother. This woman would become one of the greatest poets in American history, writing poetry for various presidents and government officials and leading advocacy groups for the blind. Along the way, she was saved, and one day she would say, when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. I want us to remember this boldness as we consider the text this morning. Uh, In this text... Um, I tried to synthesize the message into one sentence. Um, And I would say the point of this text is God puts his character on display as he saves and uses broken people for his glory. God puts his character on display as he saves and uses broken people for his glory. And as the cha-cha slide says, let's break it down, y'all. Break it down now, y'all. Um... So, the first point, in reverse, God can use broken people to spread the gospel. This comes from the first two verses, uh, which talks about Paul in his, he's unworthy for ministry, but God, in his infinite mercy, is willing to use him, of all people, the persecutor of the church, the one who at the stoning of Stephen would be holding the cloaks of the ones who are stoning him and nodding in approval of the acts being done against the early church. This is the same Saul who would curse the name of God, who would, who would persecute the church, and then be met with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and everything would change. He was so changed that he wrote most of our New Testament. He was so changed that a lot of the gospel conversations we have involve some of the, ver- the verses that Paul writes. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, the Romans road, are all attributed to Paul. And this shows how amazing of an impact he was able to make after God would use such a broken person. Two, God saves broken people through Jesus. This is verse 15. Verse 15 says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. God is able to use such broken people God's able to save them as well. He is not, he is not, it's not impossible for any man to not be saved. Everyone is able to be saved. There's no one so far gone from God that he is not able to reach out and change their life and bring them to Christ. And thank goodness this is the case because this is the story of you and me. Thirdly, God reveals his character for broken people to worship Verse 16 and 17, but I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. This is worship. This is worship. For us to know who God is and declare his praises, that is worship. And that is what we are led to do. And from this, we have, I would say, six points that Paul is making about the gospel. Uh, This, of course, is not everything that the gospel does, but from this text, I was able to extract just six points about the gospel that we might be able to consider today. So first, the gospel corrects false teaching and false belief. Maybe we don't encounter false teaching daily, but sometimes we consider false beliefs about God. Uh, this is the context of 1 Timothy. Paul is writing to Timothy uh, because Timothy is struggling. He's a, he's a, um, a young minister uh, in a church where false use of the law has become ridden without, throughout the church. And Paul is writing to encourage him and, and uses the gospel to say this, this right here is what's necessary to correct false teaching and false beliefs. And so we don't, we don't see false teaching daily. We don't see it um, often. We may see it in YouTube videos or books, but how do we correct this? How do we, in our minds, rest on the truth of God? We understand the gospel better and better. The sacrifice of Christ 
That is what corrects our false beliefs. And this is uh, seen in Acts uh, with Apollos. Um, Acts 18, 24 through 28 says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man, who was competent in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus, although he knew only John's baptism. He began to bold, speak boldly in the synagogue. After, a, after Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to, make, to him more accurately. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers and sisters wrote to the disciples to welcome him. After he arrived, hear this, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating that the scriptures demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. Apollos was able to be corrected through the gospel with the conclusion that Jesus is Lord. This is the gospel. Point two, the gospel encourages the discouraged. Again, Timothy being distraught, being uh, met with this new ministry situation that is riddled with false teaching is absolutely worn out. He's like, Paul, I need help. Paul, I need you to tell me what to do at this moment. And Paul, in the first chapter of this letter, says, let me tell you about our good God. Let me tell you about his mercy to me so that you may be encouraged. This is what we should be doing, church, with one another. Tell one another of the goodness of God in your life. Tell one another, those who are hurting, that God is good, and here's how he has been good in my life. Not so that you may boast, but so that you can point to the good and merciful God who is your Savior. Timothy is, is just ridden with fear, and he's led to the gospel through Christ as, some, as a balm, as a way to comfort him in this time of need. Thirdly, the gospel gives the sinner hope. This might be the most obvious one, but sometimes our sin just weighs us down. Sometimes we are just so, we feel the burden of our sin. And here, Paul's explaining, he's saying, there is no sin that God might not be able to save. There is no way you are too far gone. There is no way that I, being a persecutor of the church who killed Christians, would be too far gone from, too far gone from God. God was still able to save a sinner like Paul. And isn't this true of ourselves? Paul is met, he, he says, I am the worst of the sinners in verse 15. Man, I, I read this and I think, I, I empathize. Sometimes with my own sin, I feel that I too am the worst of them. And I think that's how we feel as Christians. We're so humbled. This is point four. The gospel humbles the Christian. We are just so we, we know the perfection of Christ and we know that we can't meet it. This is, this is the gospel. This is the fact that we can't save ourselves. We are met with this burden of our sin and so we are humbled. We cannot take pride in what we have done, but we can take pride in what God has done through us. Point five. The gospel reminds us of who God is. Verses 16 and 17. I'll read it again. But I receive mercy for this reason so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I remember reading a book that changed my life, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. And at one point, in one of the chapters, it's not even the point of the chapter, he talks about the extraordinary patience of God. And man, that has stuck with me forever. That God would be so patient with me that I'm not, I'm a work in progress, I'm not perfect, but that he would be so kind in his patience to continue to allow me to grow. Uh, and that, that right there is what we have. We have our hope in that and even patience with those who are not believers, that he would continue to work in their lives uh, for the hopeful day of their coming to Christ. And sixth, the gospel leads us ultimately to worship. This is the final verse. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. 
This is not a list. This is a list of attributes, but it's not a list that you would see in a theology textbook, which I have to read all the time. But rather, it is a song. It is a, it is a song of praise, a doxology of the good God who we serve. Wow. This is our hope. This is the one we will meet one day. This is the one we will see face to face. And it should lead us to worship. And not just through song, but through our, through our posture, a posture of worship, wanting to serve the great God that has saved us. The woman was named, that I talked about at the beginning of, the, of my time, was Fanny Crosby. Some of you may know that name. Uh, if you don't, I get the pleasure of introducing you to her. She's dead, but she was born in 1820, so um, I can't, she's not coming out on stage, but her name is Fanny Crosby, and she wrote many of the hymns that are found in hymn books today. Uh, she is sometimes nicknamed the queen of gospel song writers. As I prepared this message, I could n- not stop thinking about one of her songs. I'm, going to, I'm not going to sing it, but it goes, blessed, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Is this your reality? Is this your heart's desire for all the day long? Can you say with a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine? Do you live to sing about it? Do you want to sing humbly at the feet of the Father for life eternal? Do you want to tell your story to all who might hear so that God might be glorified? Brothers and sisters, this is our reality. This is our story and this is our song that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I can say confidently that in the light of Jesus' perfection, I am the worst of them all. Friends, if you're sitting here and thinking, this is not my story, I do not know the patience of Christ Jesus. I do not, as verse 16 puts it, believe in him for life eternal. Friend, now is the time to come to Jesus. Let this story be your story. Let this be your song. That you would come to Jesus and believe in him. There would be no better decision for you to make right now than to do just that. I beg of you, believe in my Savior. Feel his love and know of his patience, his mercy, his grace and kindness for you. There is no reason to wait. If you have questions about how to do just that, Noah and I will be up front after the service. Pastors will be around, and all of us would love to talk to you about salvation in Christ Jesus. I'd like to close uh, with us all standing and singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you so much. You guys can remain standing, actually, just for a minute. Uh, I just want to give God all the praise and glory for having these two young men be able to speak through his word today. It's certainly a blessing having them here to hear God's word speak through them and uh, love these guys, so make sure to come over and say hi, Uh, and I appreciate the fact that they're putting the focus where it should be, which is on Jesus Christ and the gospel. So I would like to close 
you know, it can, things that we can get in the habit of saying or doing can become just that, habit. Uh, but I love what our mission is here because I think it really, it wraps up everything that should matter to each of us. And it needs to be an encouragement, but a challenge to us to go out today, this week, and to live this out. So let's say this together this morning, and let's, let's mean it from our hearts. We want to be engaging Jesus and others every day for eternal impact. Let's help each other. Let's encourage each other. Let's focus on the gospel so that we can live that out this week. You're dismissed.